a lot of you have expertise. You should just jump in. <laughs> okay. So I just wanted to write that on the board before I started talking because it's hard to write and talk, right? Yes. Uh, so uh, Erica just asked me to get up here and lead a discussion on the different characterization methods that we can use for microplastics once we have them on our on our filter, once we get through all those other steps that we've been talking about and have them on a, on a filter paper and we want to um, determine what's on that filter paper. There's many different options and so she wanted me to uh, start a discussion on that and, and get people talking about what they've been doing, their experiences and, and um, kind of learn from, from each other on what's been going on with these different characterization methods. To start, I was just going to spend like probably like five minutes just telling you about uh, the experience that Claire and Sean and I and Emily Welsh, who, or Emily Gaston, because <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. she got married, uh, didn't, who, she didn't make it, um, that we had over the summer with these different methods. And I was going to start with that and then maybe fill in this, um, some information in the, the table I squeezed in over there. And then over here, I was going to put a larger table that maybe you guys could, um, fill in, I was going to have you pause and like talk to each other and then fill in another table on like what you're doing, um, just to see, get kind of a feel of what the group is doing right now. Uh, so, oh, there's one more thing I want, oh, I'll put on that table. Okay, so that's the, the objective. Um, so what we were, our experience over the summer is uh, we were working on, with air samples, so we actually had a active pump and we pumped air through uh, glass fiber filters because uh, that's what we've been using. That's a whole other story that I can talk to you guys about. Um, but we did it inside and we did it outside and we were comparing microplastics inside versus outside. And um, then we characterized what we collected on those filter papers in four different ways. And that's where our experience I wanted to share um, with you comes in. So first we did a, you know, just visual quantification um, with a stereoscope or dis dissecting scope. Um, and we used uh, rules on like morpho morphology and shape and color that were similar to what uh, Kara presented today when you guys were all looking through your uh, dissection, dissection scopes. Uh, and then we stained with Nile Red and we used um, a crime light uh, similar to what you guys were doing in the lab today and with the stereoscopes and the, the orange goggles. And what we found when we went from visual to uh, Nile Red is we found, um, just like Kara was saying, we found the ability to detect smaller particles um, was much greater. And we, our counts in the smaller fraction size went up substantially when we started looking um, at Nile Red. Because we had air samples, uh, we had very little, to our knowledge at that point, organic matter on the samples. Um, there ended up actually being some cellulose on there in the end, which I could tell you about. Um, but at that point, we didn't seem to have any, how do you say, um, a lot of deselection from Nile Red, but a lot of help in the, the smaller size range of particles. And then we worked with um, Suja, which a lot of you know at Thermo Fisher, <laughs> uh, and she, we ran an, um, a subset of our samples uh, on FTIR, and we uh, got data back from there. That was very straightforward. Our spectra were very clean. Uh, we ended up, because our samples were on glass fiber filters, and glass fiber filters are not very compatible with FTIR because the, um, you know, they're, if you ever looked at one, they have a lot of little, they're very fibrous, and the, the little um, glass fibers, they have a very strong IR signal, and so uh, we couldn't actually measure the microplastics on the filter paper itself. We had to transfer them onto a glass slide um, and, and then use a micro ATR on the FTR and, and measure the samples that way, but we got a very, a clear signal, very good library matches. I think they were all greater than 90% match. Um, we saw a lot of polyethylene, a lot of polypropylene. 
not not surprising, right? <laughs> um, but then we also saw, I think it like if I round, it was like 50% of the things that we might think um, were fibers were actually uh, synthetic fibers were actually um, cotton or cellulose um, type fibers. So that was I, not surprising. It's consistent with literature. I'm sure that you've read. <laughs> um, but then we also went to Hariba and we used a micro ramen to all analyze a subset. Do you want to shut the door <laughs> of our sample? Um, of the microplastics on our samples uh, through ramen. And this was a whole different experience because uh, how many of you guys used ramen before? Okay, so you can feel free to chime in. So this was a whole different experience for us because uh, we found the analysis to not be as straightforward. Yes, it was easier to look at smaller particles, um, but the ramen signal is really sensitive to color in the plastics, and it's very sensitive especially to fluorescence. So if you have any fluorescent dyes in your plastic, they can easily overwhelm uh, the ramen signal. And that happens in two ways. If, you're, if your dye is very fluorescent, it will completely swamp your ramen signal, and you'll get no, no spectra, no signal. Or if you have a dye that has a very um, strong signal that's not, not fluorescent, you'll still see a spectra, but you'll only see the spectra of the dye and not the polymer that you're trying to identify. And we found that a lot. Um, and it, you might also see additives um, that have a stronger signal than your polymer backbone. Um, one additive we saw in, I would say like 20 samples off the top of my head, is that uh, maybe more is a dichlorotin, so a chlor organotin additive that is really common in PVCs. It's a heat stabilizer, heat stabilizer in PVCs. We saw it in sample after sample, and it dominated the spectra. Um, and so that, that was our experience uh, with ramen, very summarized experience. Uh, and this, the differences that we had, same sample, different characterization. And so of all of these, um, we definitely felt you guys could jump in, John and Claire. <laughs> uh, but we definitely felt most comfortable with the FDIR data because it was very um, clear. There weren't any caveats. Um, the, m the method was straightforward. Um, and there, there weren't any, any irregular peaks or any interfering signals that we saw that were really strong. And we had very, very confident library searches. So that was my summarized experience. Um, with that, I, I can put a few things on the board that I wanted to say that um, are common. And then I thought maybe you guys could add in from your experiences. So what we see with visual, which you, you saw today, and I'm sure a lot of you have experienced, is that you might not have um, high confidence. You could easily um, misidentify a plastic um, a cellulose fiber for micro, a synthetic fiber. Um, there also can be the other way around. You might not see a clear fiber or a clear film. So you don't necessarily have high confidence in visual counting. Um, the Nile Red, Violet and I were talking a lot about this. The results you get from Nile Red really depend, maybe I'll say variation is a good term for this. The results you get from Nile Red, they really depend on your method. Because if you digest or not, that's going to affect the results you get, right? If you use whatever solvent you use to deliver the Nile Red stain, that changes your results. Because it's, I'm not going to say it right, Sol, um, it's solvent sensitive, which is, <laughs> which is solvent tochromatic. Did I say it right? No. I can never say that word. Um, so if you use different solvent, you might change what's stained, whether your solvent's more polar or more nonpolar, it might change what plastics you stain, um, depending on what excitation and emission filters you use when you're carrying out the fluorescence 
um, measurement, you might see greater or less fluorescence from your different plastics. So um, I think that it's a really helpful method, and Violet and I were talking about this. It's really useful, but you have to really know, um, validate, like Kara was showing with, with the different types of plastic and what stains and what didn't. And even if you do a validation with your um, standard plastics, they m it might, might be different with environmental plastics. Um, if you have biofilms or weathered plastics, they might stain differently. And those are unknowns that we still need to look into for this to be a dependable method. At least this is for speaking from my experience. So if you guys want to, in a minute, add in more stuff to that. With um, FTIR, um, so these are both vibrational spectroscopy methods. With FTIR, the things I wanted to say was uh, the tricky thing here, I think, is your filter type. I think um, polycarbonate is a really common filter type used. Um, that's a really big lesson learned that we had is you, when you start like your study plan, you want to make sure you use, you know what terminal analysis you're going to use in the end because that will really determine what filter type you use. So we had used glass fiber filters in the beginning of our study and they aren't compatible with uh, micro FTIR. And so that's something that we would definitely do differently because transferring particles off your filter isn't a very um, fun. preferred. It's not fun and it's not preferred. You could lose things. You could introduce more contamination. So it's not the most uh, quantitative way that you'd want to do things. So I would say like filter type is important. Um, gold filter, gold colon filters are very good for this type of application, but they're expensive. So I guess I'll just put filter type up there. Also, um, if you use a traditional FTIR, not the awesome one that, um, is it Gerardo? I would say Gerardo is working on. Your general limit that you'd want to go down to um, is about 20 microns. But what I've read so far, and you guys can tell me your experience too, is that the um, capacity for FTIR to identify plastic starts to diminish when you go below 50 microns, and um, ramen starts to be more efficient at detecting um, below 50 microns. So, um, but but the general, like um, I guess, methodological limit people put. Um, the other thing is uh, there's things like minerals some can sometimes interfere with your fingerprint region in FDIR, and then glass can too, so you want to keep glass out of your samples. Um, also, ramen, I'm sorry, uh, FDIR is very um, favorable for like detecting like polyester and, and um, PET. It's not quite as good at PVC. So there's those kinds of considerations. There could be some bias introduced in that due to that. Um, and the other things I wanted to say also with, for ramen are like filter types is also really important with ramen. So we were able to analyze our filters directly on our, our samples directly in our glass fiber filters after we wetted them down. Glass fiber filters generally aren't that great um, for analysis. Have you, has anyone tried to use them for analysis? Have, what have you found? Well, not for like ramen, but yeah. just visually, they suck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because like, well, if you have a lot of these clear plastic fibers, you either, you have to become like really good with your eye just to- Yeah, or they clean. blend right in. Yeah, is this a yeah. glass fiber? Yeah. So like, for, because um, for our water samples, we don't, um, we don't digest them. Sure. So if there's a lot of particulates, it creates like a black or brown or dirty rain. Yep. And so it kind of helps differentiate like the filter from yeah. the actual sample, but if you have like a really clean water sample, Here. you just have like white fibers yeah. everywhere. Yeah. And whether it's glass or it's plastic. Yeah, that just blends hard. in. Yeah, it's hard to tell yeah. sometimes, yeah. a lot of times. Yeah. I mean, if you're not looking, if you're looking at, um, they say, if you're looking at not as detailed, so you're not, um, looking at uh, small particles, the background is much cleaner on the glass fiber filters, but as soon as you go to a higher magnification, you do you have that issue very strongly. Um, but for like these types of methods for 
FJR and Raman, it's a bit like you're saying, it's very textured and particles can hide underneath the glass fiber filters. And also that 3D texture, it kind of interferes with the focusing of things. And so, yeah, they're just not very compatible. So um, I would not recommend glass fiber filters if you want to do any of these more advanced quantification techniques. If you're just doing like Girl Scouts maybe and they're looking at like big pieces, glass fiber filters are really easy to work with. And so they could be good for that kind of like community outreach. But if you're going to do anything more advanced, <laughs> I would not. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. Um, they're easier to work with, right, than like the polycarbonate because you, when you pick up the polycarbonate, you, it just is like, right? Yeah. The glass fiber film filter is like much more rigid and much more cooperative in that manner, yeah. Um, the other thing with ramen is you can go down in theory to one micron. And so that's helpful, but it is very strongly influenced by fluorescence. I guess I should put that up there. And, and dyes and a other additives. Fluorescence and dyes and other additives can be very damaging to your signal. Um, so there's things to con those are things just uh, considerations. Also, and I think I feel like we noticed this with our data. Raman is the, the signal for PVC is actually much stronger. And so what's interesting is that things signals that are weak here are strong here and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so, in a way, they can be complementary, but I don't know that we'd want to suggest both <laughs> methods for, uh, <laughs> um, for samples, because that would be quite tedious and not necessary. But scientifically, they do offer different, um, different types of information. Okay. Um, now, when you're working at bigger, like um, bench top, like Jackie, I know you're working on bench top levels, um, bench top, like a bench top FTIR. Um, with a, um, I don't know how you say, like normal size ATR. <laughs> um, I know that you can see dyes more easily, um, but the micro level, it's much harder to see dyes with the FTIR. Um, so that's been my experience. And then I also have squeezed in GC pyrolysis. I have not used this personally. Um, from what I've read, um, though, you can't. From what I've read, um, and you, again, you can add, you need to be able to, you need to be able to handle, I guess with these two, you need, you need to be able to, somewhat with these, more so with this, you need to be able to handle your sample so you can, whatever like particle or, or like fiber you find, you have to be able to transfer it to the py pyrolysis unit. So if it's like a nano size or low micron size particle, you're not going to be able to have enough of it. And you have to be able to handle it to transfer it over to the pyrolysis unit. And I think that they've gotten down to about like being able to detect like microgram uh, sized samples, but still a microgram of small little plastics is a lot, right? And you have to be able to move them. But if you can have enough plastics, the information you get out of here is very useful. You can identify identify polymer type well, um, any additives show up well, a lot of good information um, from there. And um, there's one more thing I wanted to say. I don't remember what other thing is. Good information. Oh yes, that's another thing. You cannot get information about counting. Like if you just do a GC pyrolysis uh, measurement, you'll get percent by mass of your different polymers, but you won't be able to count them and say you have like five polypropylene and like three polyethylene. You'll just get percent um, by mass. Okay. So it's a, a, I guess, apples to oranges situation there. So that's been my experience with those all those different <laughs> characterizations. Um, do you guys want to add anything for me to write on the board so we can share our experiences? Yeah, that's something. Um, from my somewhat limited experience with the micro FTIR with Suja, just as um, the models that are coming out are more capable of mapping, we've had a lot of conversations about filter type also, and she was really not enthused about polycarbonate filters when you do yes. mapping. Because they have a background. Yeah, yeah. It's okay, but mm -hmm. something to think about moving forward as that technology becomes more 
available and cheaper because that obviously I think I maybe I miss you know um, this is the wrong assumption but I assume that if everyone here could have an FTR that matched <laughs> and you just put your filter on that would be like, wonderful you know, come, to bed and come back the next yeah. day and you have your answer yeah um, that would be great but it wouldn't do that well with the polycarbonate filter yeah and those are the only filters we use so um, something to think about polycarbonate yeah it's still I mean it's it's nice because it presents a nice they're nice because they have a smooth surface to work with mm -hmm. but they still do have an FTIR signal so they do present that issue and last time I talked to Suja she was working towards gold coated polycarbonate she filters me to buy those too. They're yeah so but they're so expensive and so that is an issue yeah really you said you couldn't use a glass slide either because that has an IR signature no, glass, a glass slide is okay. It's when you have the glass fiber filters. Oh, okay. the, fil the actual filters, um, fibers from the filter, they're all around your sample, and they, um, they, they generate a strong signal. But she act we actually measured our microplastics with Suja on the glass slide. We transferred them from our filter onto a glass slide. Yeah, so you so can, you can do that. Them, but yeah. then you're only getting some yeah. particles.